I knew from a young age that I was not meant to be an athlete. You guys hear me okay? Okay. I was short, easily distracted. My first outing on the soccer, beel, uh, soccer field yielded a ball to my face as I was watching a butterfly flit about the field. And after my mother enrolled me in tennis lessons, the coach tenderly took her aside and said that it might be possible that tennis was not my sport. Despite my dad's impressive athletic ability as a high school football running back, I couldn't and still can't catch a ball with any kind of grace. So instead of going out for sports, I decided I would be smart. You had to be something, right? So I was going to be smart. And then one day, in the middle of sixth grade, I got some support in my endeavor. I had been squinting at the chalkboard, and my teacher called my mom to tell her I might need glasses. I was very excited. <laughs> smart people, smart people wear glasses, you know. So we went to the optometrist, and indeed, I had astigmatism. I was fitted with a prescription and selected my first pair of spectacles. I, I had to wait a while to get them. A week went by and the hotly anticipated glasses finally arrived. I was so excited to wear them to school the next day. I thought for sure now people will know I am smart. I will be that girl with glasses instead of that girl with brown hair. I was really excited, guys. So when I arrived at school the next day, I met up with my best friend. At first she didn't notice, so I asked, what do you think of my glasses? After a long pause, she responded, responded, they're kind of big. I was crushed. From that day, rather than being excited, I found reasons not to wear them. Oh, they're hurting my nose. Oh, I, I forgot to put them on today. I shouldn't have let her influence me in this way, but unless, when you're young, unless you have a particularly impressive amount of self-esteem, this is how most people would react. When I heard that this year's school verse was Hebrews 10:24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, I immediately thought of this story. What do words have to do with love and good deeds? Everything. We love each other through our words, and we perform good deeds daily through the words we choose. Similarly, we perform bad deeds, idle deeds, even sinful deeds, through words as well. So today I'm going to talk to you about the importance of words and how influential they can be. But first I'm going to see if I can move this up a little bit. So I'm a bad news first kind of person. I like to hear the bad news, get it out of the way, and the anticipation. So like in my case, I would like to hear there's no more sushi and then here, but there's lots of nachos or pizza. Apparently those two things go together in my world. Um, so here's the bad news. Words can crush others, like I was crushed by the idle words of my best friend. The Bible tells us in Matthew 12 that on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And it shouldn't surprise anyone that words are powerful and important to the Lord. The Gospel of John begins with, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the Old Testament, God spoke, and things came into being. God's words had and have power. As image bearers of Christ, our words have a similar power. And like any powerful thing, they can be used for good or bad. The words we choose can be used to build someone up, to take someone down. They can be used superfluously and without much care for them at all. Anyone who's heard the rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, knows that is just nonsense. Words have the power to harm, but often people don't intend, they don't intend to bully, they don't intend to harm with words. More frequently what happens is that a person says something idle or careless, and these idle words can and do have a damaging effect. So back to the glasses. Because I believe in telling the truth, I will tell you that in fact my glasses were kind of big as most glasses in the mid-1990s were. My friend was certainly being honest, but her words were idle. They were careless and they made me feel small. They took something I was excited about and rendered that excitement frivolous. Because God created words to have power, he doesn't like it when they are used carelessly. Words like money can be spent on useless and trivial things. It would be better if we were more thoughtful with our money and it would be better if we were more thoughtful with our words. 
I recently heard someone say that if something is true, necessary, and kind, then it should be said. My friend's words were true, but neither necessary nor kind. Maybe you have a habit of saying whatever is on your mind, and because it is true, you feel that that is acceptable. Um, but Ephesians 4 says, Speak the truth in love, so that we may grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when, we, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. My friend's words were true, but not loving, and I paid a price. Loving words build up the body. That is the community of Christ. And that's where we are here at Bellevue Christian. We're a community of Christ. And we need to work on building our community and deepening our community. So that was the bad news. Now for the good news. Words themselves can spur on good deeds. There are two ways that words can be good deeds. How we speak in general and how we speak to each other. There are a million words in the English language, and according to the BBC magazine, most people know about 50,000. Some people, like myself, are worried about word poverty, or the idea that people simply don't know very many of the massive amount of words that we have in our language. We worry, what if so few people use some words that they fall into disuse? What if we lose the ability to say precisely what we think, because the word for the thing or experience we are trying to describe is no longer technically a word? Why does this matter? And more importantly, why does it matter to God? As we established earlier, language matters to our Lord. John equates the Lord with words, and the Lord spoke the world into existence. There are a lot of theories about that first book of Genesis, but there is not a whole lot of information there. So sometimes I wonder what creation... Oops. <laughs> So sometimes I wonder what creation would be like if God didn't have the power of pre precision and an eye for diversity. Perhaps there would be an infinite number of stars, but they would all be the same size and twinkle in the same pattern. Perhaps there would be many continents, but they would be the same shape and size and makeup. And then, rather than having the millions of species on our planet that thankfully we do have, we would might only have a few. Creation can only be as diverse as ideas of God, and these ideas are reflected in the language that we use. My favorite professor wrote a terrific book called Caring for Words in a Culture of Lies, which is actually really positive in light of its sort of dark title. And this discusses all of these things. In one section, she talks about the differences in synonyms, the differences between amiable, genial, kind, and affable. Each of these words means something a little different than the others. Each of these words works to capture a unique aspect of a human emotion, a human emotion that God created us to have. We are complex beings with a desire to name things, feelings included. God created us that way. If we lose the ability to identify those feelings, then we lose the ability to feel them. And then we've lost something precious. We've lost an aspect of the human condition that God meant for us to experience. If we boil all human emotions down to happy and sad, then we can no longer feel jovial or kind or melancholy or morose or generous. And that would be a lamentable world indeed. Let me try to help you visualize the concept here. Imagine a wood shop. In the wood shop, there are many tools, a bandsaw, a hammer, nailer, lathe, router, plane, chisels, rulers, awls, pencils, clamps, hinges. The wood shop is spacious in order to accommodate all the tools the woodworker needs. The woodworker can make many different items with all the tools. They all take time and require just the right set of materials. Eventually, the woodworker wearies of having to get up and walk around the bandsaw and the workbench to get to the chisels, so he stops using them. And then the woodworker tires of having to select just the right planer, so he uses just the one that is sitting by his side. This trend goes on, and soon the woodworker is using a small hammer, some nails, one planer, and a handsaw. The woodworker has gone from being able to make beautiful, finely crafted pieces to only being able to create a few rather dull items because he was unwilling to use all the tools at his disposal. His creations are no longer unique. They are tiresome and uninspired. You can imagine that a time would come when the woodworker would not be able to use the tools at all. He would have frittered away his craft and would no longer be able to create anything new or interesting. 
And this isn't just speculation about what might happen if we stop using the words we have. Research supports it. Mike Vuolo, a writer for Slate, recently wrote an article about the Paraha people, an indigenous people in Brazil whose language lacks numeracy, simply said they don't have words for numbers. Caleb Everett, an anthropological linguist who has studied the Paraha, performed a few experiments on this tribe. Vuolo reports, for one test, Everett would lay down on a table a line of evenly spaced items, say batteries, and ask the Paraha to make a second line just like the first. For another, he would show someone a line of items and hide it from view. Again, he would ask for a second line, just like the first. In both cases, no mistakes were made as long as the lines were just two or three items long. But as Everett wrote in his paper, the proportion of correct responses generally dropped significantly for numbers exceeding two or three. This was true for all tasks, including a non-visual test that involved clapping. The Paraha appear not to be counting at all because, well, how could they? A language without numbers would never be able to investigate matters of mathematics or physics, leaving a whole world of knowledge, a whole arm of God's universe unexplored. Because it couldn't be explored. A world where we don't care about using the best word would eventually leave us unable to feel or understand whatever that word was meant to convey because it couldn't be expressed. So to that end, your English teacher spends a lot of time working to enhance your vocabulary. Each of your teachers has a unique and interesting vocabulary that can help you grow yours. So pay attention to what they say. Good deeds are deeds that honor God, and honoring his creation by attending to the precision of it through your language is one way to worship him. It is hard. It is hard to use the right word. It's very hard for me. I spent a lot of time on thesaurus.com trying to make this message clear and precise so that you can understand it. So don't be too dismayed. Again, the good news is that how we speak about the world and our experiences matters. And more good news is that how we speak to each other matters. Ephesians 4.29 tells us, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of, our, out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The Lord wants us to use words that build each other up, unlike my friend and her bristly comment about my glasses, which I do believe would be back in fashion in 2013. How do we build one another up? How do we benefit those who listen? Well, first we have to talk, and then we have to listen, and this is called a conversation. <laughs> I know. I'm not here to bemoan the state of adolescence and accuse you all of being addicted to your phones. The truth is, I bemoan the conversational ability of many, adults included, and accuse most folks of being addicted to their phones. Like it or not, and the Luddite in me likes it not, Technology is here to stay, and it does do a lot of good. For instance, you can take your phone out after chapel and look up what Luddite means, and your vocabulary is enhanced, and God is worshipped. But I do believe that text messaging and Facebook and these other technologies have stymied many opportunities to have real conversations, and even stunted our abilities in this arena when we have the opportunity. Texting is fine. It's a really good way to relay information. But conversation, conversation is a gift. A conversation, a real face-to-face -face conversation allows you to explore and hone your own ideas through questions that someone else asks, creates and deepens relationships, and allows you to say something that will benefit someone else. A conversation takes place in real time. When you text, you can think about your response. You can run it by a friend. You can put it away for a while and come back to it later. You might be surprised that you basically go through the whole writing process when you text. You probably didn't think you were doing that much work. A conversation, though, is a different animal altogether. You must respond immediately. You work with more information. Facial expressions and body language and tone of voice inform how you are to proceed. Often you amend or revise your presuppositions as you gain new information from the person you're talking with. A conversation can be risky. What if you say something the wrong way? You might offend someone else. But dealing with these conversational hiccups allows you to reassess your thinking and sometimes even allows for a bit of reconciliation among, among friends. And this art of conversation is dying. I think that people have forgotten that there are rules to follow. 
Some of you have heard that one rule of improvisational acting is that you are never to say no, and I think conversations should follow a similar rule, which is that you should not let the discourse drop. Imagine if during an interview, the interviewee responded to a question with, I know, right, or totally. The interview would be over and would also be lame. Usually, you can encourage a conversation by raising good questions. I'll bring up my favorite college professor again and have her explain some good ways and reasons to continue in conversation. Raising good questions takes practice, she writes. There are only six basic question words, who, what, when, where, how, and why. At any point, in any situation, any of them may be posed. But posing them, rather than rushing to easy and swift closure, means forestalling the satisfaction of closure and taking a certain risk. So much conversation grinds to a premature halt with end game moves, yeah me too, right? Well isn't that something? To ask the next question is to keep the ball in play. One must be willing to expend the energy required to keep listening, to turn the next corner, and to remain open to surprise. Insofar as conversation takes us in unplanned directions, it involves at least some ri slight risk that we might reveal our ignorance, look foolish, find ourselves emotionally and intellectually or verbally unprepared. So to pursue it at all is an act of trust in our own reserves, in our companion's generosity, and in the spirit that gives us, if we listen, the words we need. I can remember specific conversations I've had. In line at Target, I once had a lengthy discussion about the attributes of Fritos. Are they a chip or a snack? How did they get into that shape? Why are they so good in chili? I remember that conversation was like a game to my friend and I. We kept trying to see who could take it further, and that is a memory I hold dear, and I have several more like it. Having the time to talk to ask how you are doing and care about the answer is a good thing indeed, a good deed, honoring to God because he created us to be in meaningful relationships. And conversations are one way to get there. So ask someone how their day is and mean it. This is a good deed. Say something kind and truthful to someone today. Tell a friend the necessary truth in love. Be precise to avoid confusion. Avoid unnecessary words and idle talk. As we reach the end, you might still be thinking, why does this matter? What difference does it make if I do it your way? What does it matter if I care about my words or not? Here's the thing. If everything we do is worship, then it all matters. The way you speak and the way you listen, the chair you push in, the friend you pick up, the effort you make, and the failures you sustain. Everything matters and can be used to glorify him. So start small. Start with words. Let's bow our heads.